seated. Man, what a great time of praise and worship that was. Amen. It's time for our kindergarten, first and second graders. If you would like to have your kids go to Children's Church, Miss Carrie is back there in the back. Kindergarten, first and second graders. Y'all may be dismissed. And we will see you back up here in just a little while. You know, as I was uh, singing along with you there, that holy, 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 I was reminded back in the scripture, the book of Revelation, when it talks about everyone gathered around the throne singing the new song, holy, holy, holy. Man, if it sounded so good standing here, imagine what it's going to be that day when we stand before Jesus and we hear and we get to be a part of that choir singing holy, holy, holy. Hey, and I'm excited about it because my voice is even going to sound good then. Amen. I'm excited about that. Boy, I, I'll be able to sing along with you and not worry about it and not have y'all looking at me awful strange. Amen. Hey, today we're going to continue on with uh, the idea of making church the place to be. And so uh, if you want to uh, take your Bibles and we're going to look at the idea of fa uh, facing the reality. What happened there? There we go. Face the reality of Matthew chapter 9. Uh, we're going to be starting at verse 35. Now, I warned them in the first service that if this passage sounds familiar to you, it should. I hope actually it does sound familiar to you because we just read it last week. Amen. Now, my feelings are going to be hurt and go, but I don't think I remember that. Well, okay, hopefully you will be able to remember that. But facing the reality, and what we're going to be looking at today is facing the reality of people being lost. So let's go ahead and turn Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And if you would, stand with me. And you folks at home, read along with us. Matthew chapter 5, 9, verses 35 through 38. And the Bible says then, Jesus went about the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel uh, of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Does that sound familiar from last week? Okay, all right. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to be here together today and to just sing those praises to you. And Lord, what a magnificent praise and worship time we've had. Thank you for the privilege of getting to be a part of that. And Lord, now as we go into your word, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, speak to every person here, speak to those watching on our, our live. Lot of lost people out there. Amen? 
The world is full of lost people. As a matter of fact, there's a lot more lost than there are saved. Amen? And that's why he says the, the harvest out there, it's his harvest. It's, it's the harvest of lost people. He said, man, the harvest is plentiful. There's a lot of people out there. And so that's what we need to understand, the idea of lost. I think somewhere over time in the church, what has happened is this idea of lost has kind of lost its significance to us. We can say people are lost all the time, and really, I think it doesn't even really affect us anymore to say people are lost, to say people are dying, people are without Christ, they're lost. But what I wanted to do today is I want us to understand, again, face the reality. Jesus here is telling them, look, here's the real situation. There's a lot of people who are lost. And what that basically means is there's a lot of people out there condemned. The idea of loss kind of has lost its value. But I want us to focus now, what does loss really mean? Loss means being condemned. Condemned is guilty and sentenced to death. My friends, do you realize that when he says the harvest is plentiful, what he's saying is there's a lot of people that are condemned. There's a lot of people who are sentenced to death. Not that they're growing toward it. Not that they will someday be. But he says every person you know without Jesus is condemned right now. They've already been judged. We talk about the one day stand before judgment. And, and, and I hear people uh, say, well, you know, I, I, I'm going to be okay with that because I feel like it's going to be okay because I'm, I'm going to be good. And we're going to talk about some of those here in just a minute. But what I want us to understand is they're not going to stand before God and then be judged. Jesus said that they're already been judged. A lost person is already condemned. Now listen to what it says in John chapter 3, verse 18. It says, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Right now, where they are, born into sin, the Bible says that those people that we know that are without Christ, they're not going to be condemned one day. They're not going to be judged one day. It's already been passed. The sentence has been laid out for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wage of that sin is death. So they've already been condemned, my friend. We can't wait around here thinking it's not a big deal that we got lots of time. Folks, it's not that they will be. They already are condemned. Why? Why are they condemned? Listen to what it says. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The reason they're condemned is that they, they have no faith in Jesus. They have not believed. It's not because they're bad people. It's not because they have all these bad things going on. It's the fact that they don't believe in Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, listen to me, no man, no man, one more time, no man comes to the Father except by me. So he who is going to live his life apart from me is going, is now already condemned because they have no faith in me. Now I think we need to stop for a moment in the church and begin to get that fire back in us. Patrick talked about that fire a while ago. We got to get this fire back in because, folks, we got to realize we, we're short on time. Can y'all, do y'all know, and you folks at home, do y'all know that Jesus is coming again? The Bible tells us that just as he departed, he will come again in that same likeness. Jesus is coming again. We don't know when that time is coming, but my friend, he's coming. And listen to me, even if it's, a, even if it's another hundred years from now, do you know how fast time flies? Wow. Man, I remember when I was 16 and 17 years old, and man, I was dreading high school. I'm thinking, man, I will never, ever, ever get out of this place. Hey, you know what I did? And you know what? It's been a long time ago since I've been in high school. But I'm here to tell you it has been fast. Time is short. Even... Even the oldest person in here, even the oldest person watching, you will realize time is short because time has gone by real fast. So it says they are condemned already because they've, only, they've, not begun, they've not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But because of that, what we need to understand is another reality is it's, not, it's beyond a moral condition. 
being lost is not because of behavior. This is why, again, we need to get that reality in the church. We need to get not only that reality, but we need to get that reality out into our society. It's not an idea of being good or bad. It doesn't mean being mean and evil. I shared in the first service, my friends, do you realize right now, because of the condition of lostness, not being based on behavior, do you realize that right now, folks, you don't realize right now, some very good, decent, morally sound, probably salt of the earth as we would describe them, salt of the earth people are condemned. They're good people, amen? As a matter of fact, when they compare themselves to me, they say, well, I'm better than that preacher down there. What my answer to them is, yeah, you probably are. But there's a lot of good people, good men who are good husbands and good dads, fair business people. There are good women who are great wives, great mothers, care for their kids with every ounce of their being. And there are good people who are doing all sorts of good stuff out there. I mean, they're, they're donating money to charity. They're trying to save the planet. They're trying to save all these other things. But listen to me, because lostness is not a condition of behavior, it's not a moral condition. Those same good, moral, upstanding people who are absolutely wonderful according to the Scripture because they have not put their faith in Jesus Christ, those are the ones that are condemned. I think a lot of times we begin to look at the evil people and go, they need Jesus, but can I tell you good people need Jesus as well? Amen? Good people need Jesus. And it's not the idea of changing their, their action. It's not the idea of that. It's not that they're doing more wrong than right. I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, one day, I, I, all I'm trying to do in my life is do more than good than I'm doing bad. And I hope that by doing that one day, I'm going to stand before God, and he's going to say, hey, you did a whole lot more good than you did bad. Come on in. Or you're going to look at them and say, oh, you did a whole lot more bad than you did good, so now you can't come in. But it's not a condition of that. It's not the idea of doing wrong, more wrong than right. It's not a better, it's not a, an object of being better than somebody else. One thing that I'm, I'm here to tell you, I try to be a pretty good guy. And I am, I'm here to tell you that compared to some people, I'm a really good guy. Y'all say that too, amen? You know some people that are pretty mean people, amen? But now, here, let me, let me also confess to you. I know some people that I, 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 my behavior and stuff and attitudes a lot better than they are. But I've also known some people that are all up better with their attitude and stuff than I am. So the good news to that is I'm not going to be compared to anybody. You're not going to be compared to anybody. It's not our behavior. It's not that, oh, I'm so much better than they are. Well, listen, if you think you're so much better than they are, there's probably somebody a whole lot better than you are. So they'll get to go instead of you. Well, praise God, we're not going to be compared to anybody. But it's not a matter of me being better than anyone else. It's the idea that I have my faith in Jesus Christ. I am not condemned only for the reason that I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Amen? So if you're here today or you're watching today and you know Jesus Christ, the Bible says you're not condemned. But if you don't know him, you're condemned already. The Bible also clears it up for us. It says, in that day, many will stand before me and they will say to me, oh God, didn't I do a lot of good stuff? Didn't I teach? Didn't I, didn't, I, didn't I cast out demons? Didn't I give a lot of money? Didn't I help people out? Didn't I, didn't I, didn't I? And he's going to stand before them. He'll look at them. The Bible says, he will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And he, he doesn't go in and say, because of you were, did more bad than you did good, you have 10,000 more people better than you, you did this, you did this, this. He said, the plain, simple fact, depart from me because I, what? Never knew you. Has nothing to do with their behavior because they're going to be saying, Lord, Lord, did I not do a lot of good things in your name? Man, I did a lot of good stuff. I believe there's going to be some who say, Lord, did I not preach good sermons all my life? Lord, didn't I teach a Sunday school class for 25 years? Lord, didn't I get baptized in the water? Lord, wasn't I a member of a church for a long time? Lord, wasn't I this, wasn't I that? And he's still going to say, depart from me, you good person, you were good. 
but I never knew you. There was not a personal relationship. There was never a time that you gave your heart to me. My friends, we need as the church to get with the reality of the situation. Face the reality. Good people are condemned. Bad people are condemned. It has nothing to do with their behavior. It is in their faith. The second part of that, of being the harvest is truly plentiful, is we need to understand, we need to know that, my friend, God loves them. Do you realize those people that are condemned, God loves them? You know how I know that? Because I was once there, and I know he loved me. Because I was condemned. I was once like that. You were once like that. So God loves them. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates his own, his own love toward us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When I was a sinner, Christ died. God loved me so much. God loves the world so much. Now let me say this. If God loves the world like that, and we know that he said, for he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We all know that. We quote that one a lot. Well, here's the deal. If God loves those people that much, then he also expects us to love them the same way. He does not expect us to hate the worldly people. He does not expect us to go out and beat them silly. He does not expect us to go out there and do anything against them. What he expects us to do is to love them enough that we're willing to go out and realize there's a lot of them out there that need Jesus, and it's our job he has given to us to go out and to, to tell these folks about Jesus. Do we love them as God loves them? Because it should break our hearts if we hear these words and Jesus tells them to us today, hey, First Baptist West, there's a lot of people in Lawton that are lost. There's a lot of people around Lawton area that are lost. He says to us, First Baptist West, the harvest in Lawton, the harvest in the area around Lawton, it's truly plentiful. There's a lot of them. And First Baptist West, it is your job to love them enough to give them the message of Jesus Christ because that is their hope. Because, listen, even those good people are not going to get there unless they go through Jesus Christ. So we look and we see the harvest is truly plentiful. The second part to this is that he tells us then to pray to send laborers. Why does he call them laborers? I, I thought about that before I, as I was planning this. Why does he call them laborers? You know why he calls them laborers? Because it's, it's work. Do you realize it's work bringing people to Jesus? It, it's just, it takes effort on our part. We can't just be in here and do this and bring people to Jesus. We've got to go out. We have to labor them. We have to, we have to go after them. We have to to take time with them. We have to give stuff. We have to, to give of ourselves. But here's what Jesus said. He said that, that the harvest is plentiful. Lots of lost. But he said, man, those laborers are few. Now what that means, laborers are few uh, in comparison to, to the idea of the number of lost people. Do you realize the task for one person in the church to reach all those people is overwhelming? He said, man, compared to the number of lost people, there's a whole lot more of them than there are of us. The laborers are few. Laborers are needed. Laborers are needed. Then we look and we see, how can they, how shall they call on him? whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher so he says the laborers are few and we need to pray for the laborers because the laborers are needed so that the, not only are they comparison to the number of lost people but my friends in the comparison to the number of actual believers listen to me still still even compared to the number of believers in this world the laborers are few even compared to that number so what we're seeing here is that the laborers are few 
Even those who call themselves believers are not turning into laborers. You know that's possible? Even compared to the number of people saved that are in a church, the laborers, even in that group, is still few. You can be a believer in Jesus and be saved, but not be a, not be a laborer for Jesus. And that's where I believe, unfortunately, we've allowed the church to get, not just First Baptist West, but the, 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 the church. We've allowed the church to be okay. We've allowed people to be okay being in the church as a believer, but not have the heart and the desire to be a laborer to get people to come to Jesus through them. That's why volunteers are hard to get. That's why teachers are hard to get. That's why others are hard to get. Instead of people lining up and saying, hey, I'm in line. I want to help. Churches, and, and praise the Lord, we're not as bad, but we still have the same problem. And sometimes we have to be begging people. Begging people to volunteer. Begging people to, to be parts of missions. So he says, pray for the laborers, because even in comparison to the actual believers, there, there's not many that take on that role. He said the laborers are few, and then we pray for the laborers. Because again, laborers are needed. And I want to look at this verse very quickly. As it says, how shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Well, right here again, part of, the, part of us in the church will go, Whoo, okay, boy, pastor, you better get after it then. Because you just said there's a whole lot more of them than us, and you you got to go. Can I tell you what, what Paul was writing here? He says when he was writing about, and how will they know without a preacher, he's not talking about the hired help here. Not just the hired help. Do you know who he's talking about when he says the laborers? All of you, all of you at home. Laborers. He said, how will the people you know believe in someone they've not heard, but how will they hear about somebody that they have not believed in until you tell them? You live in front of them. You tell them what Jesus Christ has done for you. The laborers are needed. And then here's what we do. We ask God to send them. Ask God to send them. Now, we pray for all sorts of things in the church. Amen? Amen? Man, we, we, we have lists of, of things on our prayer list, and the majority of the things that we pray for in the church are physical. Pray for physical ailments. Pray for healing for people. Pray for the, this arm to be healed. Pray for the surgery. Pray for this. Pray for that. And we ought to do that. As a matter of fact, I th I'm glad people pray for me physically. I'm glad when I was going through with cancer. Man, I, I'm glad you prayed for me to be healed. Amen. As a matter of fact, if you didn't pray for me to be healed, shame on you. If you prayed on, prayed on the fact of me to get to go be with Jesus, really shame on you. Amen? So I'm okay with us praying for people physically. But I believe just as intently as we pray, he says here, you pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers. Let that be a part of our prayer. Ask God to send them. Man, we as a church need to begin to pray God send laborers from First Baptist West. Raise them up so that we can see people coming to Jesus. Raise up workers in the church. Raise up laborers in the church. And then the last one as I get ready to close off. The thing you need to understand, when you do pray for that, the laborer could be you. As a matter of fact, let me clarify this. I should have clarified it because it occurred to me in the first sermon. I should have corrected it. When I put this down the other day, we prayed this and the, it should could be you. Here's, the, here's what it should really say. Here's what God really laid on my heart. It most definitely will be you. Because you understand not one of us are called here today to just sit back and not be a laborer for him. None of us. We all have something to offer in the labor. Amen? We have something to offer. Do you know how I know that? Because you're still here. You're still here. And as long as we're here, as long as you're here, folks at home, it's you. I want to close out with this verse. It was in Isaiah 6, 8. 
God is saying, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying to me, whom shall I send and who will go for us? God is calling out, looking around, whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? And Isaiah said, then I said, hear my Lord, send me. Hear my Lord, send me. The laborer most definitely is us. I believe that God is looking around this world today, and let's drop back to verse 36. When he sees the multitudes, when he sees the harvest that's so plentiful, the Bible says he's moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. I shared with you last week. That's what we ought to see when we look at the world. They are weary. They are worn. They are scattered because they have no hope, because they have no shepherd, and that shepherd is Jesus. So my friends today, that's what we ought to look out there. And I believe with all my heart, God is calling First Baptist West to be going out into the harvest. I believe that he is calling us to stand up. He is calling us to rise up as a church and be counted and be those laborers, be the ones who have a heart for those who are lost. Be the people who have a heart for those who need Jesus. And though he is waiting, he said, I am looking around. Who shall I send? Who will go for us? And I believe God should be hearing from First Baptist West. He should be hearing from me. He should be hearing from you. Here, my Lord, send me. Here are we, Lord. Send us. We are that church. We want to be that church. Send us. Send us to what? To proclaim the goodness of God. To proclaim the righteousness of God. To proclaim the sin of the world. To proclaim the hope that Jesus Christ gives. To proclaim the, the lamb that was shed his blood for them. His name is Jesus. My friends, listen to me. Who is going to go proclaim the name of Jesus? I want it to be me. I hope you want it to be you. I hope you want it to be First Baptist West. Here are we, Lord. We know, we see the harvest every day. We're out in it every day. God, give us eyes to see them as you see them, to love the heart, to love them as you love them, and a desire to be a laborer, to proclaim the name of Jesus. Because we see that world that's hurting. We see that world that is lost. Man, there's a lot of them, my friends. The reality is there's a lot of them, but God loves them. There's a lot of them, there's few of us. And because he has called each of us. Hear my Lord, send me. I'd like you to bow your heads as we step into the next part of our worship time. And this is going to be as we enter into a time of praise and worship again. And during this time, man, I, I, want, I want you to pray. First of all, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, or maybe you're at home and you're watching this and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, man, you might be relying on your goodness. You might have been relying on your church membership. You might be relying on, on baptism. You might be relying on being better than someone else, being better than those at the church. My friend, listen to me. That could be true. You could be all that, but you could still be lost. Do you have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Has there been that point in your life that you said, God, forgive me. Forgive me, a sinner, God. Come into my life and to save me. Give me that fire for you, God. If you're here today and you don't know that, then I want to encourage you to come to Jesus today. Call upon his name right there where you are. In just a moment, if you need to come, I'll be down front to pray with you about it. Or if you're at home, would you call that number? 536 Man, somebody's there to call and listen to you today, talk to you today, pray with you today. Would you give us a call? We want to help you. Maybe you're here, maybe you're at home and you're saying, Pastor, right now, I know I'm saved. And I hear God speaking out. Who will I send? Who will go for us? I want it to be me, Pastor. I want to renew my heart. I want to, I want to come stand beside you. I want to stand beside this church and minister to people. My friends, you can do that today. I'll be here to pray with you, to pray for you. You can do it right there where you are. Call the church if you're out. It's right there where you are. You hear my Lord. Send me. There's a lot of people that need Jesus and we've got it. Let's go share. Amen. Father, hear us today. As we step into this time of praise and worship, hear us. God, we give you praise for all you're going to do during this time. It's in Jesus' name.
I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me?